You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. And welcome to another episode of At The Mic. I am your host, Keith Malinak. Today, we continue our conversation with Stu Bregeer, executive producer of Glenn Beck's national radio program, host of his own Blaze TV show, Stu Does America. And in this episode of At The Mic, Stu gives us a life lesson on raising kids that I really took to heart, seriously. And he talks about his wife, Lisa, and her beloved and very strange pet. And Stu really gets into depth regarding his views on being a vegetarian. Here's part two of two of my fascinating discussion with Stu Bregeer. At some point you met your wife, Lisa. <laughs> Y'all have two kids together. Yes. Uh, an eight-year-old boy. Yes. And a six-year-old girl. Yes. How are they doing? They are awesome. Uh, Zach and Ainsley are mm-hmm. their names. Um, they are both awesome. Zach's the big athlete. Uh, he is... Uh, yeah, what sports is he doing these days? He he loves baseball. Loves baseball. Cool. Uh, he plays basketball, football, tennis. Like, he really loves playing anything. Like, if... you know, And we're still at that age group. He's eight years old now. Where that's basically all he wants to do is throw the ball around with me 24 hours a day that's really cool um, which is awesome and i know i know it's going to go away someday and, it, and it, every time i think about it it depresses me but that's why i try like whenever he asks whenever he wants to do it i just try to say yes no matter what because i just know it's going away you know yeah. at some point he's not going to want to do it um he's uh he's a really good really good athlete and um and just loves loves to play sports ainsley is a she, she's a she's a trip man she's she's face first into life she does not care she's like <laughs> we're like zach is very cautious he goes into a room he observes it he sees the you know he does cost benefit analysis on everything going on in the room where the nearest you know? exits yeah where, yeah exactly he's that he's a planner um ainsley is like walks in like oh it's a what's the highest point i can jump off in this room you know, like she, that's how she lives. She's awesome, a huge personality, and Isn't just that just a little star. Amazing how you can create these kids with such similar DNAs, yeah, but such completely different personalities. Same upbringing and everything, yeah. But you know, it, they do like Zach is much more like I was, uh, and Ainsley is very much like Lisa was back in the day. You know, like okay. it's it's you could see we're both there. How that happens, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, we're told by the media all the time that you know gender doesn't matter, and uh, you know nothing. None of this matters. Like it seems like it matters from my at least my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So, as a father, I, I know that your time is occupied with kids stuff and everything going on in their lives. When you ever do have downtime, which by the way, I would like to point out that we're recording this interview at the end of a very very long day for Stu. He's already done Glenn show for three hours. Then planned his show and recorded that. So we are now into our, I don't know, 14 or so yeah. uh, of, of his day. I've, I've saturated the market with me talking. <laughs> like, no one is, there's no more desire for it. So I appreciate it because I know <laughs> finding time is impossible. Yeah, no, I know. But if you ever do get time, what do you like to do with your downtime? As I kind of said, there's a lot of kid stuff that I do, and 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 you know, my wife and I still try to do a date night once a week. Um, you know, make sure that that sort of happens. Outside of that, I do try to do a decent amount of uh, trips with friends. I would say over the year, probably mm-hmm. um, I'm probably above average on that point. My wife does not like to travel. Mm. Um, she has gone from a person who did like to travel, like to go on vacations, uh, to someone who basically d- never wants to leave our town, um, not even <laughs> to come to where we work. You know, just likes to stay in our town, maybe on our street um, all the time. She does not like to fly anymore. She just says, I don't know. It's just over time as she's sort of developed, a, she would call it anxiety. And I, it's a, probably a fair thing. She's also a very, um, very uh, rigid with her schedules and plans. She does not like life being shaken up. So, you know, she likes to go to the gym at the same time. She likes to, you know, make sure she knows where she's eating well in advance. And so the things that adults do on vacation, things like eating a lot, drinking a lot, gambling, going to sporting <laughs> events, like none of these laying out by the pool. These are not things she likes. So she, when, you know, I, she doesn't really like to travel. We'll do one or two things a year, but like, it, you know, that are small, um, but she doesn't really like it. So I wind up doing more of that stuff. As you uh, might know, I go to the Super Bowl every year as a tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a ridiculous tradition. And I've been able to lock it in for way more years than I ever could have dreamed. I'd be able to keep it up. I'm so glad um, you got to, experience a Super Bowl win with your son in person. Oh, that's still, I mean, I know I should probably say it's something else, but it's, you know, one of the best moments of my life. I, I uh, imagine it is. <laughs> to watch the <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles finally win a Super Bowl yeah. and and to have Zach there with me 
is it was one of the most incredible things I will ever experience in my life. I, that I know. So great. Uh, but I do that, and we have a couple like kind of traditional guy trips that we take during the year. Um, you know, uh, so I like to do that. I like to go see live sports. I like to go see uh, live music. You know, I like the, I kind of go for the experience thing. You know, when I'm around the house, there's always I'm always I have this to do list that's so long of either nonsensical things around the house or p- paperwork, you know, taxes and dumb crap like that I have to do for my life. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, there's so much reading and stuff and, and uh, you know, all that stuff that goes into the job that, you know, I don't have that much that I do uh, that's kind of just separate at home. Yeah. You know, I don't have like tons of hobbies or anything. Well, you do fantasy football. Do you fantasy football? Mm-hmm. I, I, I like that. I've been able to, I have, a, I'm in a fantasy baseball league with my son, Okay, but it's all that once a week stuff. I, it's the, I can't be. I'm not a daily manager. We're not in a particularly active league. I do like doing that though every year. That's always that's always a nice distraction. Uh, one of the things you listed as a, as a kind of a hobby, if you will, was reading. And I was just wondering, a, what's your favorite book of all time? And B, is there anything you're currently reading? Gosh, um, my favorite book of all time is a. Didn't know this question. No, was it's a big ask. Yeah. I will. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you one of my uh, one of my one book that would be in this area. <laughs> would be a book um, by a guy named Matt Ridley, um, which is called The Rational Optimist. And I, you know, it doesn't, I don't agree with Matt on everything in the book. I think if, you know, if our listeners were to listen to it, there's parts of his sort of worldview that wouldn't necessarily align with ours. But um, it, if I do consider it a formational sort of a foundational book, I guess I would call it, um, for the way I think, mm. um, which is that, you know, I think a lot of times we get caught up in this day-to-day sort of re- thinking things suck and not realizing uh, a lot of the good things that are happening, you know, mm. talking about f- everything from how we've taken billions of people out of extreme poverty in an incredibly short period of time, you know, since, you know, 1990, you know, bi- two billion people ripped out of extreme poverty. These are achievements that should be the lead news story every night. Yeah. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we've taken you know millions and millions of children who would die before five, and now they live because of medicine and uh, modern innovations and food being able to be grown in places it was never grown before. Um, he goes through that, and one of the big things he focuses on is is uh, you know how essentially trade has made the world better, um, and how that's advanced um, uh, you know uh, through capitalism has advanced us in su- such amazing ways in such an incredibly short period of time where we went through centuries after century after century where really things didn't improve all that much, you know? Um, and we kind of get this burst into the um, industrial age and then to the information age. And that improvement and that the, the way that we've been able to do that is one of those unnoticed positives. And that's what it's talking about here. It's not, it's not, it's not a blind optimism. It's a rational optimism. When you look for it, it's almost impossible not to see. And it, it almost all comes from free trade and capitalism globally. Uh, it's a miracle. Is it fair to say that we've made a 5,000-year leap? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it really, yeah. I mean, it, and that's, of course, the basis of it is, is, you know, when you come down to capitalism plus rule of law plus uh, f- personal freedom, you combine those together, um, people being able to act not only free in their own life, but also free uh, in their economic lives. Uh, that that changes the yeah. world um, for sure. Good things happen. Yeah. Um, other books uh, you wanted to? What did you want? To, um, well, yeah, I'm trying to look at my app. Here was that is that your favorite again. book, or is that what you're currently into? That's I read that a while ago. That's one of my favorite yeah. books. Um, Atlas Shrugged up there then for you? Or, no? uh, you know, you know what I don't really like. This is. Uh, I have a couple weird lines in my life. The long speech <laughs> in the middle of the book? No, no, there's a lot. There's a lot to love about Atlas Shrugged. And uh-huh. I, I would say my favorite Ayn Rand book is The Virtue of Selfishness. Right. And um, I almost I almost referenced that because yeah. that sounded like what you were talking about in the other book. It's like, look, if you look out for yourself, yeah. Yeah. you're going to make good things happen for the whole world. Yeah, and Rand's point on this is selfishness is misdefined, essentially, uh, in, in today's world. We look at that world as, word as something really negative. When, when you look at it in the way she's presenting it, it's actually a positive. Mm-hmm. So I like for the virtue of selfishness. I like just because uh, the, the 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 title is so ballsy. I, I like that idea of like you're just saying, here's here's something that here's all, you know I always say this about um, a lot of people say you know we're our job is to defend the defenseless. You know what I mean? I like to say I like to defend the indefensible. <laughs> uh-huh. It's sort of a different twist on that, that's um, and that's kind of where she I, I like that aspect of that. Um, 
you know, a couple other really books I've liked, you know, recently. Um, Suicide of the West is a great one by oh, Jonah Goldberg. I would definitely recommend. I really like the Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, Talking to Strangers, was quite good. Mm. Um, if you haven't read that, it's good. I like that quite a bit. Let's see. Gosh, there's, I'm trying to think of. I, you know, like when, when I'm reading for fun, and I, I meant to, I, I didn't explain these lines. I don't really like fiction. I don't yeah. like reading fiction for almost any reason. I've read a few fiction books over the past 20 years. Most of them had Glenn Beck as the author, <laughs> and it was part of my job to read. And Glenn writes great books, and they're and they're fantastic when you read them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I loved Thank You for Smoking back in the day. I, I thought that was a great book. Um, but I need a nonfiction book. Yeah. I love reading when I'm reading for like a sort of joy, when I'm reading for just great storytelling. I love reading Ben Mesrick books. Hmm. Um He's a great storyteller, and he he is the guy. He wrote the book that was the foundation of the Social Network, the movie. Okay, um, I knew mm-hmm. that I, I I know that name. Yeah, but I couldn't associate it. The movie Twenty One. Remember that movie with where the guys that that uh, came up with a system at Harvard to beat blackjack oh, yeah. at the casinos. Yes. He writes that book. He's a lot of books in that sort of genre of like guys who figure out some crazy scheme and wind up like you know uh, you know blowing up into this huge thing and then crashing to earth. Like he tells those stories better than anybody. His book on um, his follow up book to that is actually great. It's called Bitcoin Billionaires, and it's about the two the Winklevoss twins. Um, and their sort of life after Facebook, uh, and he tells a great oh. story about how he kind of got that he got that story wrong um, when he told it in for, in the book that led to the Social Network, where they were kind of portrayed as these sort of like preppy doofuses, like saying you know they had all the th- all everything given to them, and they walked in and they you know they were now suing Mark Zuckerberg because they couldn't come up with their own idea, and he kind of portrays them as like that's actually not who they are at all. In fact, they've gone through now two really societal changes um uh, you know our whole lives have been changed by social networks and you know at some you know i wouldn't say digital currency is there yet but it was a giant revolution these guys were at the center of two of those revolutions in their life already wow. uh, and he kind of maps out that they actually really are totally different as portrayed um and he and that's a great book too i mean yeah. I, he's really good and I, I love michael lewis as well um you know, people will remember Moneyball, but he, you know, his uh, the Undoing Project is a great book. Uh, that's a fantastic one. Uh, um, you know, anything Michael Lewis for the most point I read. He did read. He did release one really political book, and he's not. He's not a conservative. He's he's definitely a liberal. Um, and he read one political book, and I was like, I just don't think I can do it. And I, <laughs> I just, uh-huh. it's, prob- it's probably a really good story, but I just couldn't pull the trigger on it. I think it was Trump related. I don't remember what it was, uh. but uh, pretty much anything he releases. I'll read because he is such a great writer. And Jonah Goldberg, I put in that category as political writer. He's probably my favorite political writer. Gotcha. I, I know that you and I, like you referenced earlier, we can have similar musical tastes. Yeah. Uh, I think I know the answer to this. Your favorite band of all time is? Uh, my favorite band of oh, all time. Oh, no. I, I don't ask a question. Well, I, th- you... I think what you would probably say, because we've talked about this so much, is you too. That's what I figured. Which I would definitely put as one of my favorite okay. bands of all okay. time, for you're sure. You're right. You're right. I forgot about Duran Duran there for a I second. I do love so. Duran. <laughs> Duran Duran was my favorite band back in the day, yeah. You know, I, I, I still, if they come around, I'm going to see them. Uh-huh. Uh, same thing with you too. They come around, I'm going to see them. I'm going to listen to their stuff and... You know, it's they don't they're not as much as the, on the cutting edge of what they used to do as far as releasing and you know, but they're 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 both you know yeah. they're both great bands. Duran Duran, U two has had their due. They've been the biggest band in the world uh, for an extended period of time. Everyone recognized them as like obvious Hall of you know rock and roll Hall of Fame type you know, band, and still Bono to this day is still a cultural icon. Or Duran Duran, people looked at them as like, okay, this is the band that was big in like 1984. See, that's, yeah. That's and that's how unfair. Feel, yeah. That's how I feel that NXS gets treated. But. Yeah, NXS, NXS was one of my favorite bands back in the day, too. And I would say you're right. Like, it's the same type of thing. And I would say, no offense, I'm not a huge Duran Duran fan. Mm-hmm. However, mm-hmm. the untitled album, the wedding album, yes, the wedding album. is so good. So good. That it's was so, a big, I mean, big comeback, yeah. It's just so good. So, yeah. anyhow. Uh, so, yeah, very much there. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I have a sort of strange musical tastes, probably. Yeah, yeah. Are there any um, little-known bands or artists that you want to give a shout out to? People could check out. Um, I mean, you know, I like I will give um, really my favorite artist and the and the best writer of our generation is one Fiona Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a, a strange, <laughs> strange thing that nobody uh, believes when I talk about it because she, first of all, is obviously crazy liberal. And you know, if she ever, if she doesn't talk about politics all that much, but if she did, she'd be probably like three miles to the left of Bernie Sanders. 
Um, but she's <laughs> such a good writer, and uh-huh. and she's one of these artists that puts herself in the middle of any like she pulls the art from the most uncomfortable, deep, torturous places. It's almost like she's sacrificed her life for these songs, and <laughs> and, and like again, she's the same type of profile in some ways. Um, you might look at it like where you know Duran Duran was like this big band, and they kind of were this pop icon, and they were always known as that, even though it wasn't fair for a very long time. And she kind of has that same thing where she was known for a criminal, and she had these songs. But like you listen to, she's only put out I think four CDs in her entire life. Really, they're That's all it? awesome. Yeah, like I, you know, there's not a bad song through four uh, CDs. I think it's come, there's one coming out this year. Um, but like she's the type that I just like when she comes out, she'll do like twenty shows and then go away for eight years. Hmm. And so I will go to as many of those as I can uh, <laughs> because she's just you know she's she's one of those people. She'll come, like she has a free pass in life from uh-huh. me. She can come out and annoy <laughs> everyone else in our audience, and I will never care because I just love her so much. Like she is that type of uh, type of artist. Where like it's the same thing with like Nick Foles. I always say like if Nick Foles joined ISIS tomorrow, I would still love him <laughs> because he won that Super Bowl he for the Eagles. The she has that same sort of life pass. Yeah, that's funny. I was looking up. There was a game show. I couldn't remember if it was MTV, VH1. It may not even been musical related, but let's just for sake of this conversation say it was musical related. Mm-hmm. Where if you make it to the final round of this game show, then you get to pick, I think it was a music thing, I think you get to pick the band of the questions they ask you that you're oh, most okay. comfortable with. Right, right. It was 20 years ago. And I always thought, you know, oh, if I ever get this far, it's the Connells. You know, I know the Connells inside and out. Mm. Or you too, mm-hmm. whatever. If you could pick a band that you had to answer 10 questions under the gun, you know, with a minute oh, wow. on the clock, which band would you be so confident that you could answer any question of? I mean, it probably have to be. It probably have to be either Fiona Apple or Duran Duran. Gotcha. Duran Duran as a kid, like when, I, like as a high school, like high school age, I knew mm-hmm. everything about them, so I could probably pull out a lot of really random facts about that from memory. <laughs> Where Fiona Apple has only put out four CDs, so oh yeah, it's, it's very limited. <laughs> See, there, this is the numbers guy. This yeah, is yeah. the numbers guy. I'm just playing here. the stats here. Playing the odds here. Okay. What is the last song you had on repeat? That's a good question. Oh, oh he's got to check. He's got to uh, check his. Uh, can you just answer check. these things off the top of your head? I, I, one of the, this, I had a, a, a friend of mine, but you know, and there's one of these friends that I go travel with from time to time. I mean, he's one of my best friends, and we go, you know, around the country every once. Like, well, usually he lives up north, so we'll meet somewhere like for a concert or a sporting event. He's one of the guys I go to the Super Bowl with. And he sends out this email to a bunch of us, and he's like, hey, you know, we're thinking about, like, how to plan out some trips, like, you know, or if we're going to go somewhere this year, like, what should we base it around? Give me your list of your top 20 bands or artists in order. In order? And I'm like, what the hell? Like, that to me is like a six-month project. Right. Like, that is like, I I couldn't, I I couldn't even finish it. They just, I just didn't even respond. (laughs) Like, I felt like it was like like a, you had to be a bad friend to even ask (laughs) <laughs> that, don't you think? Isn't that yeah. completely like the most? Like I don't. Well, know. I will say, and I can't. I've looked for this many times on the internet since. But there was a time again about uh, fifteen years ago that I put. Uh, I think my top ten albums of all time on the radio station's website that yeah. I that I worked at in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's been long erased from the internet because I've tried to. I want to. I want to go back and see what my choices were back then as opposed to what they would be now yeah Anyhow. No, that's interesting yeah. yeah i mean but that's a big project if you love oh, music it was, and it was it's it's like uh, yeah. you get to that 10th spot that last spot you're like oh, oh what do i do here when I, I was telling you about how i used to have you know on cassette i would like you know record these sports announcing shows i also before that used to do my own countdowns Nice. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine what those things would sound like today. Oh. But I did like an end of the year top fifty songs every year for like five years. Wow! And Just I would for list them all enjoyment? out. Yeah, and I would get all the songs. I would record I would record them off the radio. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is that era. Yep. And I would, and then, I, but I would do my own little talk ups. And it was funny. I remember listening to it years afterwards, and it's like I was definitely in that like alternative radio mode where like. I, like my whole point was to try to sound like I didn't care. Yep. And it worked. I didn't sound like I cared. It was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it was really bad. So you do or do not still have those tapes? I don't think I have them. See, I mean, I'm telling you, they might be somewhere. I could look. I'm kind of torn on this one because that's what we do. Those of us that want to be in radio, when we're young, we make these stupid tapes mm-hmm. that maybe our moms will listen to, 
right? Uh, and, and we'll we'll listen to it and we'll think, wow, we're we're just good, man. I got this, you know. Well, Pat is wise. Uh, Pat Gray, uh, yes. whose show I produce, he's wise in that he found those at some point as an adult and destroyed them. Okay, so he Very doesn't smart. have them. Okay, so I have been holding on to every college radio show I did. And me and uh, who is my best man, uh, we did a show, 44 different episodes of a mm. show when we were seniors in college. Mm-hmm. <laughs> recently, <laughs> I told, I've no. told this story on the podcast. I recently dug them out and pressed play on a cassette player How'd at, that at go? home for my kids who rightfully mocked me oh, wow. endlessly. <laughs> it was so bad that I should probably pull a Pat Gray and destroy the evidence because it's not it, it's not good. It's not it's not what it thought it sounded like back in the day. Uh, Anyhow, so. Well, I'll give you two really random ones here. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, so I switched over to Spotify. I don't okay. know a few years ago, and one of the things they give you at the end they give you like this is your top artist of the year. Like they'll and they'll like you know, kind of give you a little report on what you listen to. Oh, nice! Yeah, which oh, is cool. Yeah, they kind of like. I like this. And of course, you know they're just harvesting your data for of God course. only knows what. <laughs> yes. Um, but they gave me artist of the decade. My artist of the decade. Now, I would have never predicted this, but there's a guy named Dan Mills who is an artist in New York. Um, I don't think he, you know, like I, he's not like a massive you know artist, but he's really good, and I really like his songs. But I listen to him all the time. I realize I listen to him all the time when I'm playing baseball or football with my son outside because it's music like it's not like it, you know the the music my wife she's on radio too and she she, she talks up all these songs and like i the lyrics are like horrifying <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's the equivalent of like bringing my kid into like you know a sequel to saw like it's just like inappropriate <laughs> in a totally different way but i would not want them listening to half those songs so like it's it, most of the songs are like you know they're 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 just like cool songs and i really like them so i got dan mills artist of the decade and i thought i, I don't even know if dan mills had himself as Artist of the Decade on Spotify. But I have this one weird thing that I have, and you yeah. kind of know this, I think, from back in the day. Every two or three years or so, I get on to one really random pop song or artist that I just get very much addicted to. I can think of a couple. Okay, you can. <laughs> if, if you want me to yeah, try, try to see if I can win. So I know Party in the USA or something. Oh, Party, Party <laughs> in the USA I had a little fling with. I would say that was, <laughs> it was a long-term relationship. Okay, there's uh, there's a Britney Spears yes, song. Yes, that, that one would... I can't remember what it toxic was. Toxic would be toxic. the song. <laughs> yes. Okay. Britney Spears, Toxic. Um, and I go through these. I had a little Kesha phase. There was a small Kesha phase. Huh. Um, and uh, I and my current phase in this world is is Selena Gomez. Okay, I love Selena Gomez. I, I, I don't know, know who why. she is, but I I wouldn't know a song. Oh, if it I give you the whole me. catalog. I have a whole playlist <laughs> oh, on wow. Spotify called "Embarrassing," and it's just <laughs> all. It is, See, it's I the call title it, of it. I call those songs guilty pleasures, but no, that, that's no. a better title. Embarrassing. I'm just embarrassed. Like I don't want anyone to ever look at this playlist. <laughs> <laughs> but do that's favor, all it is. If I get hit by a bus, the first thing you do is <laughs> you delete, delete my, my embarrassing, embarrassing playlist. playlist. <laughs> Promise me, Lisa. Okay, that's funny. That's it's good. in my will. First thing to get any funds from my accounts, you must delete my embarrassing <laughs> playlist first. And you, you mentioned to me. Do you know this uh, answer off the top of your head, Keith? Uh, you know, because I asked you. Mm. What's your last song on repeat? And I didn't. I'm yeah. guilty. I'm guilty. I didn't know. So I just looked, and it's very random. But it's a song by a band named Geneva, and the song is Best Regrets, mm. which transitions nicely into my next question. As you look back at your life thus far, any big regrets, anything you would do differently that you would care to share with us? <sighs> Uh, well, I would never work with Glenn Beck. Um, that would be first. No. <laughs> Which, by the way, I did the math while you were talking earlier. Yeah. I think you're right at 25 years, a quarter century with that guy. Almost, right. Well, this is 20, it's 2020. So, is no, he... I started with him in 90, the, 97 was okay. the first time I started okay. with him. But we're over 20 years. Yeah. yeah and really, was, we're together basically that whole time. No, I mean, um, you know, regrets, you know, I... There's probably a few. I would say, like, you know, probably revolves around not spending as much time with family and things like that that sure. I should. I mean, like, you know, I, one thing that does this dumb industry we're in does kind of, like, suck you in in, in, a, in a lot of ways where you – unless you really try to balance your life, you will – it will be very unbalanced. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's probably times where I've – you know, you, you fall into those traps – 
Um, you know, there's there where you just, you know, you're just working all the time, it mm-hmm. seems like. And, and it does, you know, it's one of those jobs, too, that kind of... I, Again, it's not real work. I don't want to make it. It's, I'm not like I'm no martyr here. Like this is That's a, a dumb point. job, right? Yeah. Like, it's like a, you know we're we're sitting here making fun of things and talking about news, but it is a lot of the stuff where you're constantly refreshing news feeds and reading articles, and you don't ever feel like you're not working. You know exactly. Um, it, you know it's a little bit different, um, but I, I, there's definitely a you know I'm, I, there's a million regrets I'm sure I could think of, but mm-hmm. time. Yeah, you know, it goes fast, man. You know, like, yeah, my kids are, you know, already turning into, like, little people. Mm-hmm. You know, you, that's why I really, one of the first things I did when I first had my uh, first had my kids was to make sure, obviously, you try to spend as much time as you can with them, and you try to do all those things and try to be engaged. One thing, one little trick I picked up very early on was when your kids are young and they're doing things that they're, like, learning for the first time or showing off for the first time, they look up at you and want you to, like, like they're looking up at you not because they want to see if you saw it, but they want to see your reaction. They're living off of that reaction, right? Like, kid, you know, you know, you're just like, hey, daddy, watch this, and he goes up and he shoots, you know, sh- shoots a basket and makes it. The first thing he does is turn around and look at you to see what your reaction was. And like, I think there's a big like the way that we would normally interact with someone, right? Is they would say, hey, check this out. You'd watch him. You'd watch the ball go through the hoop. You'd say, oh, that's cool. And then you might glance back down at your phone or look to what your next thing is. And I always thought it was a, like or always a focus for me to make sure when they turned around and looked at me, I was looking right at them mm-hmm. with like a big reaction, mm-hmm. so they knew it was a really cool moment. And like it's stuff like that that I've tried to. I might made sure I did that stuff. Yeah. I know there's twenty th- other things that I didn't do and that I will someday regret that yeah. I didn't do. Um, and you know, like all that as far as spending time with them and, and, and making those memories, you always want more of them. Yeah. But you've, I've tried, I've, I've come to that point where I've realized, I, I think of the negative. I go to the worst case scenario sometimes, and like I, I know this is drying up. I know at some point this kid's got, these both of them are not going to want to come near me. They're going to go play with their friends. They're going to do everything else. So while they're, while they're still into dad, you know, we try to maximize that as much as possible. You were telling that story. I wish you and I had had that conversation years ago. Uh, because I'm thinking of my own self and how many times are we looking at our phones yeah. when they turn around and, yeah. or, or how, how many times do I give them a half-baked response? Yeah, sure, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, I'm going to try to apply that. I, I appreciate that. That's, that's, that's a good thought. This is Stu's life tips. Stu's life tips. I've got, I've got one of them. You just Boy, heard it. Who's getting interviewed now? Right? <laughs> um, any big fears that you have? Snakes. Yeah. Ladders. Ladders. Big, uh, is, is it the going underneath them or climbing up them? I'm convinced I'm going to die falling off of a ladder. Wow. I don't know why. I don't know how I got that in my head. Every time I go up on a ladder, which I have to do fairly often because my kid hits, like, you know, <laughs> baseballs up on the roof all the time. And I have to go to the gutters and pull them out. I'm, I'm just sure the ladder's going to collapse and that's how I'm going to die. So <laughs> I'm a little scared of that. Um, you know, I, like, I, I, you know, my l- job is basically to. You know, it's a 20-year experience of me saying, calm down, Glenn. You know, that's basically <laughs> my entire job. Uh, and, and he does say that. Glenn Beck actually says that quite a bit, that it's your job to, I guess, be the skeptic, to kind of yeah. rein him in. And that's right? very natural for me. Like, I, that's how I see the world. Like, uh-huh. most now, if you if you downplay every single thing you come across in a day, you're going to be right most of the time. Um, because most of the time we get we're emotional creatures and people get you know they overdo it and they don't and they judge it by some hyped media report mm-hmm. and you know it's my job to kind of dig into that and 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 you know obviously we see sometimes that these things aren't hyped and and that's uh, you try to recognize that as well uh, but you know that you're trying to always do self analysis and mm-hmm. I don't know are you good at it you, you don't really realize that probably until much later in life you have two dogs don't you always get the same kind of pooch? Uh, we had two pugs. Um, one of them did die a couple oh. years ago, so we now have one pug and one golden retriever. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, I didn't realize you had yeah, a golden, golden retriever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So totally you, different experience, but they're both great dogs. And it's Miles and Piper? Miles and Piper, yeah. Okay, very nice work. Mm-hmm. Well, I just read the email that you replied oh, to. Oh, okay. Well, I forgot I sent it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about a, beard, a life with a bearded dragon? Griffin? Oh, what, God. What, what is it? Oh, no. Oh, it's it's not, bizarre. Is it a regret? It's no. Uh, yeah, yeah, go back to the regret <laughs> section of this. No, no Griffin's cool. Um, he's a bearded dragon. So a bearded dragon's like a lizard that starts really small and gets very big. I would say that's how I would describe him. Um, he doesn't really move around a lot and doesn't really do much of anything. Um, what do they eat? Uh, this is the, this is what's fascinating. So my wife is this like very girly, very like stylish, 
um, you know, always made up, always looks good, like, you know, host of like a, a pop, uh, you know, a pop crush nights of, you know, a popular, like, you know, uh, top 40 type of show. And for some reason, she got it in her head that she wanted to get this bearded dragon. And she kind of blamed it on my kids. Like, oh, you guys want to get this? And they're like, yeah, because they say yes to everything at this point. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, this sounds awesome. <laughs> so she, but I think she just really wanted it. And so now we've gone, whatever it is, a year or two with my wife, who is the last person on earth. Who She's incredibly clean. The whole house is always very clean and very organized. She's very organized. And every day she's bringing up live crickets to this cage and then <laughs> feed it, like taking them out of this thing like I can't understand how it's her doing it and I'm like I'm not doing it I didn't want I didn't want to get a lizard in the house like she takes the thing out she just attaches to her like shirt and just walks around the house with it she puts it down on the floor her and the dog the dogs hang out with Griffin and then like she'll put it back in the cage and throw live crickets in this thing and the thing runs around and eats live crickets it's 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 bizarre. It's the strangest thing about my life right now, I will say. How often do you have to buy a batch of live crickets? This is a great question, and it's one that should have probably been asked before we got oh, no. a bearded dragon. Oh, so no. the bearded dragon eats, I don't know how many crickets, a thousand of them it seems like, but it's probably ten, I don't know, every time it eats. But you can't have, like, there's only a certain amount of crickets you can buy. Like, to me, I would, if I could buy 10,000 crickets. And just be is, done with it, And right? just be done with it. And, like, they would just automatically <laughs> fall into the cage or something. Like, okay, maybe that makes some sense. You, she, you can buy, like, I don't know, 40 of them at a time. And it probably eats between 10 and 15 every time. So she's going back there every, every like, pet smart every uh, three or four days uh, to get a bunch of crickets in this cage. And they're like, you know, they're not expensive. There's yeah. crickets. People usually want to kill them. <laughs> which Griffin does oblige yeah. with, sadly, for the crickets. Um, but, yeah, no, it's strange. She has to go back there all the time and get these things. And I'm like, can't you get them shipped in from Amazon or something? And the answer is, yes, you actually uh-huh. can, uh-huh. Um, which I would be doing if I were her. It's like DoorDash for Griffin. Yeah, it is kind of like DoorDash <laughs> for Griffin. That's a good point. Uh, but I, for some reason, she doesn't like to do it that way. She wants to go to the pet store. So there's like... You know, four people a year go into pet stores now in the year 2020. She's there like every single day. Yeah. Does she ever feel any remorse as she's driving home with these live crickets? No, she's she doesn't. Time she's time with them and she's like, you know, <laughs> just no no emotional attachment to them. No, huh? Apparently not. And she, But she does with the Griffin. She loves the Griffin. Does not regret that purchase at all. Oddly. <laughs> that is awesome. You are a vegetarian. Yes. And you have been for, I mean, as long as... I can 15 I, I, years. I remember as a listener mm-hmm. before I worked with Glenn, I remember when that happened and I remember telling myself <laughs> ah, this is short lived. I mean, I believe the sincerity of it <laughs> yeah, at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. No, and I remember not a bad Glenn, bet, by the way. Yeah. And I remember Glenn yeah. making fun of you. He's like, oh, you're going to be wearing Birkenstocks yeah. and all this stuff. And I remember thinking, nah, <laughs> this will be like a year or two. But no, you've stuck with it. And and I and I've heard you talk about it before. Where I don't think there was anything specific. It wasn't anything traumatic. Nothing like nope. that, right? It was just what, what was it that, that made you just want to do that? So I kind of got into a weird. Um, you know, one of the strangest things about being in talk radio and doing this for a living is you spend every waking hour examining your own viewpoints for consistency. <laughs> Right, uh-huh. like, you, and you know, you know we, when you have you have an audience, uh, you know, millions of people are hearing you say things, and they remember when what you said last week when you disagreed with yourself, mm-hmm. and they will call you out on it every single time. So it is it, you kind of are constantly assessing your your set of viewpoints. Um, so I had kind of gone down a road a little bit in which I just didn't really feel comfortable with it. It didn't make much sense to me. Like I I, I couldn't really place it properly uh, as it aligned with my, my general views but i you know it, it's, it's such a traditional thing it's so much built into american life like my parents were, were not vegetarians like at all um and so it's just built into life it's not a thing that you most people give a second thought at any point in their life it's just built into the way you live and it's accepted and you never really examine the viewpoint mm-hmm. and so because i'm in this dumb industry i spent time sort of um examining the viewpoint at one point but i didn't stop eating meat for a while and then one day just one i had done a bunch of like atkins style um diets and i don't know if anyone remembers the atkins a lot, diet a lot of meat involved yeah right? it's it's a low carb diet and it's basically all meat and uh-huh. cheese like i just ate like here's a slab of cheese here's some bacon <laughs> fold them together and eat it like that's basically what i did 
Um, and I had done that for a while, trying to like lose weight and stuff. And just one day, it just grossed me out. I, I, I can't explain it. It just one day, it just hit me. Like, I don't, why am I, why am I doing this? I was like, I remember it was a grilled chicken sandwich. I was like, the rest of this is awesome. Like the cheese and the bread and the, the, all this, the, whatever mayonnaise was probably on there. God only knows what it was. But I just remember thinking like the part I really don't like is this like meat in the middle. I just didn't like it for whatever reason that day. So I stopped for like, I don't know, maybe a week or two. And I went back and I had one more, one more uh, meal where I tried it out one more time. It was a meatball sub. I just like couldn't, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't get into it. So it's been now 15 years. And like people like think it's, I I was joking, say I'm America's only conservative vegetarian, (laughs) which it's not true. There's usually, there's like two or three of us. Um, (laughs) But I actually think philosophy wise, it's actually much more consistent with conservatism than it is with liberalism. Do tell. Like if you think about it, it makes no sense for liberals to be vegetarians when they don't care about human life in the womb. It makes absolutely no sense. If you're going to be sensitive about the life of a living creature, the first thing you should do is care about humans. Now, from a conservative perspective, you could say, okay, well, there's human life, and the baby is in the womb is a human life, and below that is animal life, and I, and I think that's of lesser value so it's low enough that I don't care, to, and I don't, I'm going to eat it, right? Like, like, that's actually at least a consistent order of things, whether you agree with it or not. It is not consistent, however, to say I want to protect animal life and not human life in the womb. That makes no sense to me at all. Yeah. So I actually think, okay. oddly, it's one of those cultural things that aligns much better with conservative values than it does with liberal values. But because of some weird cultural tweak at some point, because the people who like the environment somehow, like, you know, worship at the at the uh, altar of the environment, sort of worship at the uh, altar of the animals because they're running around in the environment. I don't even know how it got started, honestly. Yeah. I don't, but they're not very well aligned at all, I don't think. These are fair points. Um, I'm still going to eat meat. No, I, this, no and I'm this is you. where I get it. Like, when, when, when people ask me about this, <laughs> I always say, like, I don't, I'm not trying to convince right. anybody. I, like, it's not my vibe. Like, <sighs> yeah. it's an important, like, it's, a, it's to me, the, and one of the reasons why I do it is I think, I think, look, we are as... You know, I don't get into the philosophy all this often here, but like we were deep in the podcast. People have already tuned out so I can do it. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you get to that point where um, I think we as, you know, you find it in religion. You can find it all over the place where we have dominion over animals. And I think that's true. However, there's everyone lives on a scale to as far as that goes. Right. Like we no one believes you can do anything you want with an animal. Right. Like you can't torture an animal. Everybody's got a line. Right? Everyone's got a line. And the same thing goes for for, you know, vegans. Right. They would say if a tiger is running at a bunch of, of, of kindergartners, I'm, I'm hesitating as I say this, but I think they would say it's OK to get rid of the tiger. Right. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. Anymore, man. Who knows? Who knows? Well, you know, we live in Bernie land at this point. I don't know. Uh-huh. But I mean, the point is, everyone has a line there. And I think like to me. You know, as much as I can, I like to side. It goes back to my philosophy when it comes to abortion. Like I'm siding, I'm I'm putting myself on the side of life when possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, like you know, I'm not saying like if you're start like some person starving in Africa like needs to you know like if you're in China and you need to kill a bat and it's going to release a nice virus around the globe, like that's probably okay. Uh, you know, but when you're you're trying to survive, I just feel like the line for me isn't. The difference in taste between an egg and cheese sandwich and a bacon egg and cheese sandwich. Right. I, a bacon egg and cheese sandwich probably is better, but I feel like eh, I feel a little weird, you know, dealing with God's creatures in that way I for that you. that that benefit. Have you seen over the fifteen years that you've been a vegetarian, the menus have probably caught up to you oh. and expanded greatly from when you started? Right. Life is much better, Keith. Yeah. Uh, than in the past. This was much more difficult in two thousand five. In fact, you know, it was much more difficult in. I mean, 2012, when we came down here, right? 2011, 2012. Texas, for a vegetarian, not that fun, right? Philly, New York, there's a lot of options. Down here, it sucked, especially at the beginning. But And this has changed, you know? I mean, I, and I think this goes to a really a smart thing that they're doing. You know, vegetarians can be really annoying, um, and most people don't like them very much. <laughs> um, and I think that's largely because they're nagging you all the time. Uh-huh. But secondarily, it was because it was like this sort of like weird, pure thing where it's like, you know, you need sprouts and seeds and you live on seeds and sprouts. <laughs> and it's like, well, that, people don't like that. And capitalism, though, has, I think, stepped in and said, you know what? 
people really like the taste of meat. It's really freaking good. And, you know, um, and if we could give it to them, I think if you, given the choice, right, uh, between two things that taste exactly the same and an animal dies for one of them and not for the other, people would be like, well, sure. I, I don't, it's not like I'm like, I have a bloodlust for animals. I'm, right. This is just new, you know, the, the nutrients that I want and the taste that I want. So finally, I think people have combined you know, the idea of not eating as much meat with capitalism and said, hey, uh, here's an impossible burger. It tastes really freaking good. Um, and people actually like it. And People do like it. You know, not everybody loves it, but I mean, it's a lot better than the products used to be. It used to be just like beans. It would just taste like a bland bean nothing. Yeah. So that technology has come a long way and the embrace of capitalism. Not not saying this is like some like sacrificial, like religious tenant. It's just good. And you get the benefit of these other things as well. You still do the tofurkey uh, Thanksgiving? <laughs> a tofurkey I've had before. Like, it's all right. You know, I mean, I will say there, Worthing, Worthington's um, protein loaf is <laughs> what I would recommend for those starting out on, uh-huh. on Thanksgiving. Okay. It's like a meatloaf, but it looks kind of like turkey. And it actually does taste pretty good to the point okay. of even Pat Gray yeah. said it tasted good when he had it. That's right. That's uh, right. But, you know, some of the food is actually pretty good. You got to go with someone. Don't, you know, it's like one of those things like don't go into the area of, a ta- of town that might be dangerous Unless you have, unless you live with a, you're with a local who can show you the right areas to go to, go with somebody who knows this stuff. Don't just walk into a place and try to eat some vegetarian food because it probably will suck. Uh-huh. But there's enough out there now that you can actually eat. A lot of it's edible now. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, one question left, and then I'll let you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I asked you if you had a bucket list, and you said you'd like to travel to some weird places. Yes. On that list, uh, let's just go through these. North Korea. Why? Oh, I'm fascinated with the culture, right? I mean, it's a bizarre, bizarre place. The place I really want to see more than anything is what they call the Hotel of Doom, mm-hmm. uh, which is this bizarre. It's such a great story in that, like, <laughs> they built this in the uh, – in it was around the Seoul Olympics, which I want to say was 88. Yep. And, uh, yes. And yep. so, obviously, North Korea and South Korea, not, not great friends. Uh, <laughs> and so the communists were like, well, well they're going to bring the Olympics. They're going to show off South Korea. We need to do something for, f- to show us off. We need to make a big statement. And, and they did. And Seoul is right there at the border, is it not? Yeah, it's pretty yeah, close. I think it is. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. relatively close. But it's, but they, so the, in Pyongyang, their capital, they built this giant oh, um, hotel. I, for some reason, I thought they did it within it wasn't, view I, of no, the Seoul area. No, no it's in Pyongyang. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. And uh, although it's a big hotel, uh, in fact, it was at the time, I believe, the tallest hotel in the world. It was 110 stories or something. And it's a giant, basically a giant pyramid. And they started building it. This is when Kim Jong, uh, it it was before Kim Jong Il, actually. Yeah, Kim Jong Il was just coming into power. Yeah, I get them all mixed up. Um, Yeah, it's before, well before Un, and actually before (laughs) Il. Uh, Kim Il Sung, right? So yeah. he is like the you know the godfather of them all, and he decides he's going to build this hotel, 110 towers. He builds it out of concrete, gets it halfway built, and the Soviet Union collapses. <laughs> so um, they there start. Goes they, the there goes the funding, supply, right? Yeah. So they can't finish this thing. So now they have a 110 story pyramid <laughs> that's supposed to have 10 rotating restaurants at the top. It's got no windows. It's just this decrepit old thing that they can't. It's too big. And, and giant to tear down. Mm-hmm. It would cost so much to tear down that they couldn't do it that way. Right. So it's this eyesore in the middle of the city to the point that they're like photoshopping it out of postcards. Wow. Um, like this doesn't exist. So it sat there forever. I'm, I've always wanted to see it. I'm, I've always, you know, I would just love to see it. Um, and now they have actually covered it with glass on the outside and they've been able, as they've come back a little bit economically, they've been able to make it look like it's finished. Although it's not finished, you still can't do anything in it. Wow. But they do threaten every once in a while uh, that they're going to to do something with oh, it. Like they've also totally. like set fireworks off of it now. They kind of use it like as a I don't know like I mean it's just it's just a giant glass triangle in the middle of their city. And to to note, it's about 80 stories taller than anything else in the country. Wow. So it's it looks ridiculous. It's this giant giant pyramid among little tiny buildings all around it. It, it is a bizarre bizarre place. So I I I've always wanted to see that. That's one though. I, I don't think I'll ever see because I would probably be killed if I went there. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Let's see. Chernobyl is a place you yes. want to visit. And I forgot <laughs> how this came up uh, on the show I produced, Pat Gray Unleashed. We were looking up, there's like tourist packages. You could actually yeah, go there. That one I could do. I huh. actually thought, I tossed around, we, we were doing this um, uh, cruise a while back. 
uh, cruise through history we were going to do. Pat was going to be on it. Glenn was going to be on it. Bill O'Reilly, you know, had got you know uh, delayed. Track, yeah. um, but uh, I was thinking about after after this after the because it was going to be over in the area going to oh. Chernobyl. <laughs> and Glenn actually wants to go there too. Oh wow! Um, I'm fascinated by that. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of abandoned buildings obviously um abandoned <laughs> landscape like old like cities that have fallen into disrepair like there, there's stuff if you go on like reddit and stuff there's um there is uh subreddits like for like abandoned porn <laughs> and it's just like what does that mean it's basically like it's a genre where people will go to a band like there's a you know ridiculous train station in detroit one of the biggest train stations they had there Closed down. Oh, it's been sitting you. there forever, they and, it, and it, it just okay. a, it's abandoned. They call it. Yeah, they, it's not actually. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. Like actually going to no. That's what it's I'm like trying food. To it's like food porn. Yeah. Okay. You know, like, I got it now. I like, got it. I'm know. slow, man. No, it's We've right. We've been through this. Um, it's not actual pornography. Just <laughs> in ca- okay. just for listeners like, who might not know this. Lingo. Someone not opened up that magazine in a while. What's I probably happening? probably should have been more clear. It's not actually your fault. <laughs> but yeah, abandoned porn is one of them where they just they go around and they take pictures of these ridiculous old abandoned buildings, and I just love that stuff. So. I'm dying. I, I mean, I would love to see that. I'm a, I'm a total Chernobyl nerd. I like. I love the series, and you know, it's it, you know, again, you see both. You see both in both of these things a pattern here, which is the failure of communism, right? Yeah. Both in, in same North Korea and in Chernobyl, um, and what is the result of it? Uh, those things are fascinating to me. Why Turkmenistan? Turkmenistan is a, a bit of an oddball one for me in that it was a, also part of the Soviet Union. Uh, broke off into to Turkmenistan, a Soviet. Um, leader, party leader, wound up becoming president of it. And his theory was, his name was, Tur- he was known as Turkmen Bashi. And his, <laughs> um, his, his theory was basically, we can't, if, as we're starting a new country, um, we, we need to have pride. The people need to have pride in their new country uh, or it will not, never succeed. Mm-hmm. Now, at least this is the story he told. <laughs> And the only way that you can really have pride in your country is if you really are proud of your president. Right. You're, you're, so <laughs> what he this. did was build endless statues of himself all around the country. One famous one is, is gold, and it, 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 it rotates to face the sun. Uh, you know, he, he literally renamed two days of the week. One of the days of the week, he, or no, it was months. It was one, two of the months. He named one of them after his mom. And one of them after his book, which is still to this day the greatest piece of book promotion of all time. He, he forced everyone in the country in school to read his book, but then named one of the months after it, which is that's a great idea. I mean, that's just a freaking great idea. Um, so he, it was a very much a cult of personality. Uh-huh. He eventually did die uh, the late 2000s. And um, in his place, uh, they obviously, because I mean, he did all sorts of crazy stuff. Like he, cl- he decided one of the problems with the healthcare system. And we've had a lot of healthcare debates here. One of the problems with their healthcare system was everyone. There's these hospitals all over the place, and we didn't know what their quality was. We should just make everyone come to the the, the capital when they needed to go to the hospital. So he closed all of the hospitals around the country except <laughs> in the capital. <laughs> so wow. that was a that was an issue. Um, so I like the, 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 I'm fascinated by that. So oh. and and the guy when he left, he died. Um, they put his dentist in control of the country. It's literally his, his dentist, who is still there, okay. uh, Beric Medidoff, I think is his name. How do people not revolt just against that I know. system? Well, he had power, right? I mean, it was it turned into really like a, a dictatorship. And, you know, it, it, there's funny aspects to it, not great for the people, um, but it would be a fascinating place to go see. Guess, um, yeah. and, I, and even to the point now where it's become, it's, it's picked up a little bit of steam. When, you know, when I first started noticing it, I worked with a girl at CNN who was, uh, who was a big Turkmen Bashi nut and got me into this, but uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't know she, there was one. I know, I know. Um, but he, like John Oliver just did a big monologue this year about his dentist, uh, pre- uh, the guy who took over for him, <laughs> and it's it is very it's quite funny. I mean, it, you know, it's a bizarre, bizarre story. So that one is is up there as well. Right. That one I could actually do as well. Okay, and one last place you want to get to Dubai? Why is that? Uh, Dubai, I think, is another really interesting thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of really bad things about Dubai. Um, however, it is also like this grand, bizarre experiment in capitalism in a weird way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the tallest building in the world is there, and I'm fascinated with tall buildings. But also, just they have just took this piece of desert and decided to basically make this capitalist paradise uh, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Um, and... 
you know, the, that is kind of like this type of stuff that I really find fascinating. You know, it's like it, seeing this, they kind of just, in a way, it's it's similar to Vegas in a way, but, you know, where Vegas, they just built this thing in the middle of, of, of the desert. That's what they did here, but it's still under a lot of the old, I mean, it's still got a lot of, is you know, Islamic presence and uh-huh. dictator type problems and all of this weird stuff. And then in the middle of it, you know, like, you know, it's like a it's a combination of like the 21st century and the 18th century. Like you're in the middle of think picture being there, the tallest building in the world, some of the most expensive hotels in the world. Every other car is a, is a Bentley and, you know, all this wealth, tons of oil wealth, tons of European wealth. It's like European, like it's almost like they're Vegas in a way. And sometimes you just have to go inside for a couple hours because a giant sandstorm blows through and you can't walk outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's just such a, such a bizarre clash in cultures. So I find they it really are, fascinating. They are doing uh, the most with what they can in that kind of part of the world. Yeah, and 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 the the leader, while massively flawed, uh, also is a is a big fan of part of America. Like he doesn't under I don't think he'll, he never will understand the freedom and and the and the exact package. But he he is a fan of of capitalism and decided you know. It, you know, look, we, we have oil and we can't do oil our whole life. It's going to run out. Eventually, people are not going to be uh, fascinated by oil. Better technology is going to come on. We better make this into a pretty special place beforehand. Right. So they built, you know, they would take, you know, they would build islands in the middle of, of, of water, man-made islands and build entire housing developments in there. Wow. Um, the engineering there is incredible, the things they've actually been able to accomplish. And, of course, you know, the building, the Burj Dubai, is, is the, it's, the, it's the most spectacular building and really ever created by That's human the beings. Tallest building. Tallest building in the world by an incredible amount. How high is it? You know? Ugh, I couldn't I couldn't give you a number okay. on it, but it's it's you know, it's like two Sears Towers, you know, or what used to be wow. the Sears Towers on top of each other. Yeah, I'm trying where, to find where I want to say the you know, like the Empire State Building was like it was like eleven hundred or something, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred, something like that. It's like t- uh, you're you're stacking massive US skyscrapers on top of each other. Hundred and sixty stories. <laughs> 2,716 feet yeah. tall. Close to 3,000 feet tall. Goodness. Yeah, it's it's pretty spectacular. So I, I you know, I would like to see that at some point. I, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't, that's the place they have the, uh, the the driving range into the like on right. Haven't I seen Tiger Woods on top of some really yeah. tall tower hitting the ball into a lake or whatever? Yes, I think that is where that is. Yeah, they have all sorts of crazy stuff there, and it, it's just a bizarre culture. Yeah, that is cool. Uh, the, okay, so we're, we're wrapping this up. I just need mm-hmm. to take a picture of you here that, that will be the uh, accompanying uh, thumbnail with the uh, podcast here. Yeah, move the mic out of your way so you can get this uh, wonderful Philadelphia Eagles shirt. And big smile, cheese. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Stu, thank you so much, and you can catch Stu. He is the executive producer for how long did we say now? Uh, 20, years? 20, 20 something years 20 something years too long for Glenn Beck uh, <laughs> Glenn Beck's radio show and then he does his own show on Blaze TV Stu Does America oh I can't and by the way social media under the same name yes at, at Stu Does America please mm-hmm. go follow the podcast subscribe yes. to it YouTube subscribe there as well please it is a great show however Uh-oh. I have to tell you mm-hmm. that the greatest show in the history of Blaze TV yes. is Pat and Stu. Do you, you know, miss that? I I love Because everybody, everybody else does. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's <laughs> funny. It's you know, I we love doing that show. It was a really fun time and it was just we had so many great, great shows. And I, I always tell Pat, like, whenever we come back and do a show or a segment even together, we just are able to jump right back into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And everybody, you know, everybody loved that show. No. Uh, it was a it was a, it was a great time. I mean, it was doing a show with Pat, and you know this, doing this every day. There's nothing better than it because yeah. Pat. First of all, he's just you know an incredibly talented, smart, funny guy. Yeah. But he also makes it easy. You know, like he 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 brings you along when you're when you're in the middle of a joke and you're trying to get to it. He helps you pull it out. Like you know, <laughs> he he's just so good at that, uh-huh. and he's such a pro. It's such and you know, look, Pat is one of the best guys I've ever met in my life. He's such a great guy, yeah. um, and you know, I love him to death. But yeah, that show was really freaking fun to do. Yeah. Well. I wish you much success with the new show and everything that you do here. We appreciate. So also thank you for making time today. I know it's the end of a very long day for you. I hope you get some good rest tonight. Stuber gear. And one of these days I might learn how to spell your last name. (laughs) Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Keith. This has been At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. 
Look for At The Mike Show on Twitter to connect.